afternoon. I'd like to welcome you to today's Medical Center Hour, which also doubles as Medical Grand Rounds. I'm Marcia Day Childress from the Center for Biomedical Ethics and Humanities here in the School of Medicine. Um, whether we are students, teachers, or clinicians, we're all learners. That's one reason we're all here today. And to a great extent, if we recognize that learning frequently entails imparting as well as taking in new knowledge and skills, we are all educators. As educators, our work includes maintaining awareness of how we do what we do, from our own ongoing preparatory efforts and critiques of effectiveness, to assessments of outcomes, review and revisions of methods, and renewal of our performance in and commitment to the educational process. Along the way, we grow and change. The people we work with grow and change. The context and content of our endeavors change. Sometimes we can discover that our stated assumptions and principles are at odds with our actual practices. When, as educators, teachers, and learners, we reflect on and examine what we see, what we feel, what we say, what do we find in the way of guiding assumptions, principles, values, and practices? What do we do then? How do we best address any asynchrony in these and set things aright? In this Brody Medical Education Award Lecture, all of us here today, learners of all stripes and seniorities, will practice some foundational skills, such as cultivating a beginner's eye and more accurate data collection in order to uncover and examine habits and thought patterns that may no longer serve us. Understanding our own assumptions and the values they reflect will allow us to be more intentional in designing our educational programs and our learning and clinical practice environments so that they are more principle driven and that they better meet the needs of patients, learners, and caregivers. We'll do this today under the expert and lively tutelage of Dr. Elizabeth Gaufberg, who's Associate Professor of Medicine and Psychiatry at the Harvard Medical School, the Jean and Harvey Picker Director of the Arnold P. Gold Foundation Research Institute, and Director of the Cambridge Health Alliance Center for Professional and Academic Development in Cambridge, Mass. She's also a core faculty member in the Harvard Macy's Institute's Program for Educators in the Health Professions. One of the best educator of educators that we know, Liz comes to us as the University of Virginia's 2018 recipient of the Brody Medical Education Award, a citation which is all about consummate teaching, intentional pedagogy, and educational excellence. We're delighted that today's program doubles, as I mentioned, as Medical Grand Rounds. We thank the Brody Medical Education Committee and its chair, Evan Heal, and the Academy of Distinguished Educators for supporting this program and also for sponsoring Medical Education Week for 2018, which is going on all this week with lots of activities we hope you're taking advantage of. Please join me in welcoming Liz Gaufberg, and I think we're in for an active hour. Okay. Thank you, Marcia, and uh, thank you all. Thank you to the Brody Committee. Um, if someone can simultaneously be treated like royalty and like one's best oldest friend, that's how I've been treated since I arrived here on uh, Monday. This is just such a, a warm, lovely community. Um, Back in January, when I was at the Harvard Macy Program for Educators in the Health Professions, I sat down with my friend and mentor, Gene Corbett, and um, asked him what he thought I should do for this hour. And he said, I just want to say one thing. The Brody Committee is all about stirring the pot. So I, I listened to that, and we decided I would do something on assumptions about teaching and learning and make it active. But last night, uh, being someone who tries to do a good job, I just Googled stirring the pot. And the first thing that came up was the definition from the Urban Dictionary, and this is what it reads. 
Someone who loves to proliferate the tension and drama between two or more feuding people or groups in public to get a rise out of people in hopes of starting a storm of drama and uncomfortable conflict, sometimes for personal gain, but oftentimes just for the thrill of confrontation. <laughs> No, no, I planned it all wrong. But luckily, the second um, uh, entry under Phrase Finder asks us to picture a pot of soup. A lot of ingredients have settled to the bottom, out of sight until stirred. Metaphorically, a lot of issues, assumptions, and tensions can drop out of sight when nobody mentions them. One can stir the pot to bring issues to the surface to create awareness and affect change. Phew, I think that's what you meant, Jean, right? So I've designed a session today that's kind of a, um, a briefer version of something we do at the Harvard Macy to get people to think about the assumptions that they bring, those deeply held assumptions they bring to teaching and learning. But a lot of what we'll talk about today is really relevant to practice and to life. Um, I want to start out with a story. Um, a lot of my stories come from my kids. I have four daughters who are now in their um, teens and early 20s. But from the time they were little, they would say things in the course of everyday conversation that would cause me to see things in just a different way. And that makes them some of my best teachers. So this story um, dates back about 15 years ago when my daughter Eva was in kindergarten. She's a junior at Northeastern now. But she came home from school and um, I asked her, how did it go today? She said, well, we, we heard a story in school. And I said, tell me. So she told me a story about a little boy whose job it was to sit on the side of a mountain and watch the sheep. And his job was incredibly boring. There was no one to talk to, and he was lonely. So he pretended like there was a wolf coming to attack the sheep. And when he called wolf, the townspeople all came. And when they discovered there was no wolf, they got really mad at him, and they stormed away. And as young children do, she repeated endless cycles of the boy crying wolf. Um, and I listened until the day that there really was a wolf. And when the little boy cried wolf, nobody believed him, and nobody came. And the wolf ate all the sheep and ate the little boy, too. And at that point, Eva just stopped. Well, maybe she had to go to the bathroom at that point, but she just stopped, and that was the end of the story. So I waited, and I said, you know, Eva, that's, that's a really, really upsetting story. Was there any lesson to that story, any, any moral? And she considered and then responded, yes. The lesson is, no matter how many times your kids trick you, you should still believe them. <laughs> so so I, I laughed too. I think I called my husband at work and he laughed. I have to admit though, there was this little place inside of me of worry that Eva got the wrong answer, you know. Um, and then that was around the time when I was beginning to develop an identity as, as an educator. And so I started thinking about that very well-worn path of an Aesop's fable that was so familiar to me. Um, and what some of the assumptions about learning were that kind of un uh, underlay that. I also was thinking more about just the little boy and kind of what was he doing all by himself on the side of the mountain? And you know, like, why wasn't he in school? And what about child labor laws? And you know, after the third time that this happened, couldn't that town have predicted it and figured out a way to help the sheep to graze and the kids to stay alive? And like, there could have been some really useful problem solving that came out of this, this dilemma. Um, and what about the pedagogical strategies that are um, valued, embedded in that story? So um, using fear to stimulate learning. That's a really scary thing for a five-year-old to hear about. Um, then again, using stories to stimulate learning, which we've done a lot of in the last couple of days with the, the Brody um, experience. Or what about having an entire educational experience drive just to one right answer, rather than kind of a multiplicity of possibilities? 
Um, and so I, part of what I hope to um, accomplish today, this is not a tie it up in a neat box kind of talk. It's kind of, it is a stirring the pot and getting uh, some things to rise to the surface. But I hope that you will begin to think about your own well-worn paths and habits, your automatic behaviors as educators, as learners, and maybe consider, you know, perhaps there's another, another path um, that could be viable, another um, means of transportation, or even a, a, another destination. And you may end up recommitting yourself to your old ways, but, but it's that process that I'm hoping to um, engage us in. And we will be doing, I'll talk for a little while, and then I have some sort of interactive uh, exercises that I, I would love to en engage you in. This is a quote by Einstein. It's a miracle that curiosity survives formal education. And I just love this because it, um, it suggests that there are certain things that um, we can unlearn in the process of, of becoming health professionals or learning anything new. And we really have to be tuned into those unintended byproducts. What does our process of education do to, to curiosity, to empathy, to other valuable traits that we bring with us? Um, and so why are we doing this? One thing I've just told you is to try to identify habits and patterns that no longer or do not serve us. Um, to learn from and to work effectively with others whose assumptions might differ from our own. And sometimes when we find ourselves in conflict or disagreement, you can, you can, st you can sort of get into conflict at a more superficial level when you, when you really discover that it's at a deeper level of assumptions that you might differ in. And really being curious about others' assumptions, I think, helps you get past that. And then to be intentional in designing um, both educational programs and cultivating both learning and practice environments that are principle-driven. Um, I think of principles as kind of tried and true assumptions that, that we've really looked at and we've elevated to kinds of guidelines for for action and practice. And these are kind of 50,000 foot questions that um, we, we look at at the Harvard Macy Educators Program. And I'm going to ask you to, to think a little bit about today. Um, some of us have never really thought about these things. Like, what is learning? Is it an informative process, literally lifting the lid off something and pouring information in, or do you think of learning more as a transformative process where the, the shape of the container or the connectivity is actually changing? Does learning happen in an individual or does it happen within a community? Um, what's the difference between teaching and learning? I know that when I first started out, I felt like if I delivered content, that learning would happen. It was like when I used to pack my kids lunch in the morning and I would put in examples of the five food groups and feel really good about my nutritious input until the day that I opened the lunchbox at the end of the day and the only thing that was eaten was the cookie. You know, so too in a lot, of, a lot of what we do, that there is a difference between teaching and learning. And some of our efforts now at competency-based education, I think, really are a recognition of that. Um, is the teacher a content expert, a coach, a guide, a co-learner? Uh, how do we think of ourselves as educators? And um, do we stick with one format when the context might um, sort of do better with another? Um, assessment. Uh, are we looking for short-term sort of uh, results or sort of longer-term uh, outcomes? And a lot of times when we say assessment, we think of particular formats that we're familiar with, like multiple choice tests or OSCEs. Um, and what we're trying to get at here is, is sort of education that is sort of more to move from format driven to principle driven. And if you're thinking about sort of what are our ultimate goals, um, Peggy and others here are working on, on wisdom. But what, you know, what is the point of this endeavor? And our, our assessment should follow from that. And then goal of education. Are we passing on traditional values or um, helping learners adapt to and make change? Very different assumptions underlying uh, these efforts and building from there would mean we'd be building radically different kinds of uh, kinds of environments. And so these are about education, but, but if you think about practice environments, do we think about healthcare as a, a good or a service? 
You know, is it a product? If it's a product that we make in our laboratories uh, or uh, in boardrooms and we sort of then deliver to patients who, who use it, it's very different than thinking of healthcare as a service because services are intentionally co-designed by the people that consume those services and the people that provide them. Even we're using words like consuming and providing have assumptions at their, at their root. But um, what do we feel in practice about um, who is the good doctor or nurse? Are they people that never make mistakes? If that's an assumption that's at the root uh, of what we believe about the good clinician, um, what does that mean when somebody infallibly makes a mistake, I mean, invariably is going to make a mistake? How do we respond to them? Um, so just really getting at these very deep-seated questions. All right. So this is a talk about assumptions, and I think it's only fair to sort of give you some of my own assumptions, my own sort of conceptual underpinnings in thinking about this. I sort of ascribe to a, um, a social constructivist way of sort of thinking about knowledge, which is that individuals construct sort of new understandings, new knowledge through the interaction with, of what they already know and believe, their own sort of conceptual lenses, um, and the ideas, events, activities that they, they come in uh, contact with. And this is reinforced by uh, neurobiology and you know, we're tribal creatures and especially in situations like this where you're being sort of um, welcomed into um, a community, a profession, um, social constructivism can be a very sort of powerful force. And, I, and, it, and, it, and, and knowledge often, often ends up, you know, in those, sort of held in those uh, social groups. I mean, just as an aside, um, to, to, it's very interesting to think about social constructivism in the age of the internet. Um, and I think most of you who's familiar with the phrase, the filter bubble, anybody? Have you heard of that? You know, we get most of our news from news feed, from our news feeds through our social media, but there, there are these algorithms that feed us information that often ends up just reinforcing what we already believe. You know, if you looked at my news feed, you would think that every medical student in the country is, you know, that trained in art museums and has certain, you know, um, uh, advocacy beliefs or. Uh, and we, we're, we're constantly f fed information in this way, which sort of ends up, I mean, another way of saying a filter bubble is, is an echo chamber. And so this incredible tool that has the um, potential to expose us to so many diverse um, opinions, viewpoints, frame frameworks, ends up often insulating us. Um, and the other conceptual underpinning is that human beings, by nature, have limited perspective. And we have limited perspective partly just because we have sensory limitations. You know, our, our eyes and our ears only have a certain range and acuity. Um, and we have this remarkable ability uh, that we call selective attention, which is what allows you to walk across the street without getting killed or, or, or study for the MCAT um, and focus exclusively on something and block everything else out, right? Um, it's, it's remarkable. Um, at the same time, when you're selectively attending to one thing, you're necessarily blocking other things out. Um, and then uh, we also have limited perspective because of so social constructivism. We have certain um, deeply held constructs that, um, and, and we're going to sort of talk a little bit more about this, that really influence what we pick out in the environment. And I like this cone in the box example. It's kind of a, a simpler version. How many of you know the um, six blind men and the elephant? Uh, yeah, most of you are nodding, but this is just, you know, it's a, it, it's a cone in a three-dimensional box, and if you're person A looking through that peephole on the top, what do you see? Circle. And if you're person B, triangle. And you are convinced that it's a triangle, and the other person is convinced uh, that it's a circle, and that's because they don't have a more expansive understanding of what's in, in the box. And, it's just a metaphor for how we all walk through life. We have kind of a piece of the picture and getting us to you know, zoom out when, when we need to or can or need to and zoom in when we need to is, is really important. So sometimes just, um, just remembering this can, can, can help. Um, so uh, 
Gosh, if I had time to switch out this slide, I would have put a pot of soup up. But this is really just to make the point that some of our assumptions, something we, I think of an assumption as something we sort of take to be true without proof, the minority of them we can explicate. And, um, but much is, is under the surface. And so we need to come in through a side door at our assumptions. And um, the way that we're going to do this today is sort of three routes. The first is just to um, sort of expose you to the idea of the ladder of inference. Is this a familiar term to anybody? OK, good, a couple of people. but. Um, uh, and then we're going to kind of go for a metaphorical walk together. And then we're going to dig in the sand, metaphorical sand for assumptions. So um, let me just see if I can do this. So this ladder of inference is a, is a concept that ties much of what you know I've, I've shared as a preamble together. And here we go. This is about a. I think it's about a four or five minute section of a video. Okay, so was that at all familiar to any of you? <laughs> Nothing like that has ever happened. Huh? I mean, I'm from Boston and, oh, my mic is on. It is on. Can you hear me now? Is it just that it got dislodged? Um, and uh, this is a m multiple times a day sort of uh, occurrence. Um, and uh, I would just ask you to, 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 to take a moment and in your own mind, imagine um, just changing. You know, these were sort of bland cartoon figures, but you know, change the type of car or the gender of the driver or the age of the driver is a young millennial or a very old person or the race or ethnicity. And just see, imagine yourself in that situation and see if anything um, changes. I can tell you just a, another uh, just qu quick example. Um, so this kind of thing, as I said, happens all the time in Boston. And, and um, you know, we all suffer from a little bit of uh, road rage. But in another sort of transportation uh, experience. Uh, my husband and I love to drive two hours north of Boston to this lake, Squam Lake, where we have a little cabin. And um, when you're out on the motorboat, people are so friendly on Squam Lake. You know, they smile and wave. It's so different than Boston traffic. And, uh, you know, if there's a, uh, another boat, you, you know, you slow down and you smile and wave. Or if there's a kayak or a canoe or you make, you know, special care not to make a wake and you smile and wave. And, Last summer, I was with some friends, and I said, God, people on Squam Lake are so nice. And without missing a beat, uh, beat, my friend Mark said, Liz, you realize those are exactly the same people that are giving you the finger in Boston traffic. <laughs> right? So it's error of attribution, and you know, there's just a lot that goes on with us cognitively. So, so this ladder, it isn't really a, a ladder. It's, 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 it's a loop. And it, it goes around very quickly, very uh, instantaneously. You see this one loop here um, that our beliefs, our mindsets, actually influence what we see. Like if I expect the people in traffic to be rude, suddenly you know I'm, I'm noticing a lot of rudeness. And if I expect them to be nice on the lake, I think I probably see more niceness. And then there's there's um, another loop that I don't have here, but that our actions actually feed back something. We've been talking a lot about who's responsible for culture here over the last couple of days. Um, but our actions within uh, uh, the cultures and systems in which we work actually feed something back and, and change reality. Um, so it's, um, it's a fairly instantaneous process. but. Um, and, and, and literally, we end up just jumping to conclusions. Um, but the beauty of the ladder metaphor is that it allows us to stop on any rung and notice where we are. So one place to stop, and we're going to do this just in a moment with an exercise, is to kind of notice what data we're selecting. I mean, the world just is. And it's, I can't remember who said it, blooming and buzzing. Who, who's the literary person? You probably know Joyce. Or um, The world just is, and, um, and we selectively attend to, to 
to what we need to in, in the environment, but are there ways to more expansively be open to what is? And some people who use mind, mindfulness practice or other practices to cultivate the beginner's mind, that's a little bit of what, of what they're getting at. And there are other ways uh, as well. Um, or you can notice, if you remember in the video, that moment of feeling that emotion, that anger was a, was a clue that an assumption was underneath, uh, underneath it. So being able to sort of stop that round and round um, activity is, is part of why we use this ladder metaphor. Stopping the hamster wheel. I had an epiphany. So sometimes you can just, just stop. Um, and the ways that we do this, just, just briefly, are you know, honing our skills of close looking. That's you know, through observation. And some of the things Marcia does in the art museum are really about honing, honing observation skills, just um, bringing more in, um, being more aware of your own assumptions and reasoning, uh, explicating your assumptions to others, um, and inquiring into others' assumptions in a non-judgmental way. By the way, this is something I meant to say at the beginning. There's no like um, hidden agenda here in terms of assumptions that I want you to get at at the end. It really is about learning more about yourself. It, and it's not to label other people's assumptions. It's really just a process of, of um, exploration. So I want to tell you about this book that, um, actually there's a reference on the handout that Marsha put together, but I'm excited about this book. A group of us heard um, this woman speak at a conference at MoMA last year. She's a cognitive psychologist who wrote a book called Inside of the Dog that was um, beautifully written and um, uh, sort of on the bestseller list for a long time. But she's a New Yorker. And um, she describes walking her dog around the block uh, and the kind of space out that she was often in when she did this. Her mind was elsewhere. The whole point was for the dog to do his thing and she'd come back in. But she often just didn't even notice her surroundings until she had a little kid. And when her son was about 17 months old and he started to walk, his beginner's eyes opened her up to things that were going on. It could have been like some trash, a trash bag on the sidewalk, or the fact that there were letters of V's and O's embedded in you know, the fences around the buildings. And it gave her an idea. Um, and when she started tuning into what her, her son was seeing, she, she realized how much she was missing. So she decided to go for a walk with experts. Um, and she ended up going for a walk with 11 experts, starting with a geologist who showed her the limestone facade of the buildings and the fossils embedded in them. And after she went for a walk and learned from this geologist, she never saw the block in the same way. And then she went with an urban wildlife expert. I mean, who knew there was something like that where they can actually show you where the, the rat holes are and where the pigeons roost. And, um, and uh, what were some of the other folks? Oh, you know, someone, who, entomologists, so about bugs on the underside of leaves, or a font expert. So she, they went around and they looked at signage. And, um, and then there was somebody who was sort of a uh, body language expert, uh, right? Sociologist. Sociologist. So like, how much space do you leave when you're walking down the street between people? And every time she took a different walk, she learned more from the expertise um, but she also realized it was infinite. There were worlds within worlds on that block, but she couldn't hold on to them all at once. But they ended up you know, informing her understanding and enriching her understanding of, of her own neighborhood. Um, so what I'm going to ask you to do now is um, I want you to think about your own learning and practice environments, just one of them, because I know you've, you're all over the place. Um, but one of your own learning and practice environments, just conjure it up, a place that you come frequently, a place maybe that you kind of are on automatic behavior some of the time. And imagine inviting somebody to go for a walk with you. And imagine who that person would be and what you might want to learn from them. You can't know what you're going to learn because you haven't taken the walk yet. You can do that after the, after the talk. But and think broadly. I mean, it might be if you're an attending, it might be a learner, or it might be somebody completely from out, outside of healthcare, somebody with a different role. What would who would you take a walk with? And we're just going to take like a minute or two to talk to the person next to you. Who would you take a walk with uh, who has different expert eyes than you? And then we'll kind of harvest some of the ideas and then, and then move on. Why don't we come back to the, the group?
<laughs> so I'm just wondering, uh, can folks just, you know, shout out some of the, you know, just some of the people that uh, came to mind, some of the expert eyes that might inform you? Yeah? Okay. Evan. I, um, so I thought it would be fun uh, in UMA clinic to have a folklorist. A folklorist. Interesting. Tell us a little more about that. Just because our patients have a different biopsychosocial spiritual model of health, um, and to uh, to better understand, you know, what they think is going on with them. Very interesting. Thank you. Other uh, other experts you'd like to walk with? Yeah, over here. Wow. Wonderful, thank you. Oh yeah, so walking with patients. And did you say inside or outside of the hospital setting? Inside, so how, do, how does this environment actually impact the patient? And that's something that really is accessible to do, right? Um, others? Yep, over here. With Thomas Jefferson. I love the fact that you have somebody from history. That would be. That, that. Yeah, you'd have a hard time explaining what an iPhone is to him, I bet. But, but, but fast, that's really uh, very interesting. And, and how, how are his founding principles translated to the modern day? Really interesting. And there was somebody back here I saw. Hi. So uh, my office is in the oldest part of Hospital West, and I would love to walk uh, through the complex with someone who knows the history of the architecture of the building, because the building I'm in dates back to the late um, 1800s, early 1900s. So there are all these buildings that have been connect connected over the years that had different functions in the past. I walk through every day and have no idea. So interesting, the history of the architecture, um, and you've sort of uh, named archite an architect as, as somebody you could walk with, and you know, I think that's fascinating. It's a way that our, our teaching and, and uh, care space is designed, you know, does that actually support our goals? I mean, Marsha was telling me when we came in that there used to be this big stationary panel desk here, uh, and then the podium, which sort of belies you know, a sense of how learning should happen in the very design. Other, maybe just a couple of other walks that you would take. Yep, back here. Non-medical family member. A non-medical family member. Great, thank you. Yeah, thank you. So sometimes we need an, an English to English interpreter, right? <laughs> For um, anybody else here? Okay, great. So you get a sense, and you know you can keep your wheels turning. And um, uh, I don't know if it's going to be possible to get Thomas Jefferson to go on a walk, but there might be people that um, that really could expand your horizons. Okay. So um, as I said before, um, one way down here um, is to use mindful practice and and some of these ideas of getting other other perspectives. But then there's this nexus. Um, uh, with, when we jump to conclusions, and often that's when we feel an emotion, when we have a reaction. It could be anger, frustration, surprise. Um, and when you, when you have a reaction, it can um, be useful just to just dig a little deeper. And this is a guy, I don't think it's the exact guy, but when I was a little girl, I used to visit my grandparents uh, in Florida. Um, so this was maybe... 40 plus years ago, my grandparents um, had a house on South Beach, which was pretty dingy back then. My, my grandma had the prediction it was going to be really fancy and glitzy, and that's why they invested, but they never got to see, uh, uh, see it turn into that. But we, I used to follow a guy that looked a lot like this because I was fascinated. This is a little metal detector, and it would go click, 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 and then he would dig, and there would be treasure. And so I'm going to kind of ask you to do the same thing. I, I'm going to ask you to notice your emotional reactions. That's your click, 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 click. And then, um, and this is, uh, 
through the course of watching a video in a teaching and learning environment. It's a parody. Um, and you're, there is no way, there's a lot going on in this video that you're going to see everything or respond to everything. But I just want you to notice your own reactions. And then the next step is, what does my reaction tell me about a fundamental assumption I hold about teaching and learning? Okay, so watch the video. What are your reactions? And then we're going to debrief together um, on and to start to get at some of our assumptions. All right, <laughs> so a lot was happening there. And you know, we're short on time, so normally I would have you just do a, do a pair share, but I'm gonna ask her people, brave people to share um, just your reactions to any aspect of this. And it's, it's good to try to be specific, like when he said this or when this happened, this was my reaction. And then we'll convert it to what that might say about your fundamental assumptions about teaching and learning. So reactions? Yep, back here. Less specific, but just in general, just overwhelmed. Like that, that tenderness in your stomach. Okay. You're having flashbacks, maybe, to your own training. So overwhelmed. Um, and so noticing that reaction, can, what does that say about an assumption that you hold about how people learn best? So a slower pace or uh okay. <laughs> Thanks, Marsh. Yeah, I don't I don't have anything else. Yeah, if you could just repeat it because I don't know the other yeah. Um yeah, so I was saying that it, it was a very visceral, like overwhelmed, pit pit in the stomach kind of uh, feeling. Um and what that would say about me is that maybe a more piecemeal um, approach to getting the information um, because I feel already like there's no way I could do all this mm -hmm. um, kind of before I even started. Gotcha. Kind of type of feeling. Right. So time to absorb and process perhaps. Um, other reactions? Yeah, over here. Like one specialty was very prejudiced against other specialties and wanted to convey that attitude. Yeah, and what does that say about um, an assumption? Can you convert that to an assumption you hold about teaching and learning or practice? We assume our specialty is the superior one, I guess, or something. And, is it, uh, and how might that impact um, our, our learners? I mean, and it doesn't have to be, it can be negative or positive or. Well, clearly it's, it's gonna set up prejudice in the learners before they've actually obtained any data to make their own independent yeah. decisions. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Other, um, I saw another hand over here. Yeah, over here. Um, I just, I think I related a lot to the IV teaching specifically and that feeling of, oh my gosh, I'm supposed to understand this and I have no idea what he just said, but I'm gonna have to figure it out and pretend. I think that that plays into the need for like ongoing f feedback and a loop between a teacher and a learner and making sure there's actual understanding mm -hmm. because a lot of the time in that fast paced kind of an environment, there isn't time for that or at least you don't think there is, but it's obviously critically important that there is. So time and opportunity to ask questions and to assess whether learning has happened. Great, thank you. Um, yep, over here. I was going to say there was clearly some like intentional intimidation to like to yes. belittle the med student and to get them to get the message that they don't really know anything or try to convey a message that they don't know any have any practical knowledge compared to a resident. Mm -hmm. And what does that say? So yeah, I think a lot of us picked up on that. But what does that say about a fundamental assumption you hold about teaching and learning? Being intimidated is not going to be a good. For the <laughs> but you know, then again, there might be a, like an, an an edge between a certain amount of challenge. Like, what's what is that right balance between challenge and um, you know and 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 uh, 
ease, you know, but intimidation when it crosses that line, it sounds like that's something you assume isn't, isn't going to be helpful. Um, other, uh, yep, Tim? I just want to say, too, that, you know, the mic. we, yeah, there's a mic right there. We, we teach the way we were taught. Mm. And that assumption there is that because we were taught that way, we're going to teach that way. And it's a rite of passage, you know? We were belittled, and we were beaten down, and we worked all these hard hours, so we're going to make those under us uh, experience it the same way. Yeah. yeah, thank you. So that is often, uh, often what underlies our practices is just this is the way it's always been done, and, and this is what we're going to uh, continue. So, yep, back up here. So I noticed that as I was watching it, um, I immediately was following Carter and Benton, and I was following their action. But because you had primed me, I started looking at the things that were happening around them as well. But had you not primed me, I would have missed the cop walking through the OR suite, which you know, was is kind of like the gorilla uh, video. Yes. You know? uh, and <laughs> if so, we had more time, that was going to be one of my slides, but we didn't. Oh, but I just yeah. ruined it yeah. for you. Sorry. <laughs> um, but the idea that um, that there's an opportunity yeah. just by you know a subtle hint that yeah. you can actually bring out a lot more that that you could lose. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. I don't think I've ever seen. I've watched this many times. And I don't know that I've ever seen the cop, so thank you for that. So it really makes, makes the point about selective attention. Great. Um, other, other reactions? Maybe I'll just take a couple more, and then we can, we can wrap up. Um, yeah, we have two. Oh, hi, Preston. <laughs> I was struck with every bit of information appeared to have, every bit of information provided appeared to have the same level of importance. So everything from don't shake his hand, he's whatever the issue was, to this is the most important number you ever need, this is the most important, everything just was like deluged on to him with you got to know it all, it's all equally important. Okay. And probably not the case. So it's probably not the case, and so if you can sort of convert that into maybe a principle, is it do learners need some guidance? Guidance on what's in, important. Okay, great. <laughs> yep, uh, Preston and then... There's a fine line between um, wonderful confidence and arrogance. Mm -hmm. And here is a phenomenal resident who's excellent in his shoes, but yet is a bit cocky. Yeah. And here is his chief of a department celebrating his skills, but also cautioning the student to not assume mm -hmm. some of those other qualities of his behavior. Yeah, yeah. that was kind of a, 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 a beautiful moment because it was a recognition of complexity and that as a learner you can choose what aspects of a role model. And it's a very mature kind of idea yes. that yes. Pe people can have wonderful qualities yes. and, and yes. challenging qualities and it's all embodied in the same person and, and yes. how can you, know, can you hold that? Maybe one more and then uh, one more reaction and assumption. Yeah? So I'm realizing that we bring to what we see our own sort of tendencies. And my takeaway from that is it's 6440 to call the operating room. I have an ear for numbers. Huh. <laughs> 64, right. So, and you can't, there, that was like I can't a, get rid of it. It was a fire hose. <laughs> I hope you don't have to call the, opera the operating room here because I think it is a different number here. But, so we only have just a, a few more minutes. We, we had a backup video. Um, what, what I'm going to encourage you to do as we move forward um, is actually to remember the ladder and, and to get to know your own ladders, the conclusions that you automatically jump to, to actually make a commitment to take some walks or even just inquire of somebody you're already with how they see things. Um, and then to notice when you're responding and dig for what's underneath. I never, honestly, never get bored anymore when I'm uh, in, a, in a lecture or teaching and learning setting because I, I do that thing where I, I try to figure out what it is that I'm responding to and what it says about my, my own assumptions. Um, 
it's really fascinating to be kind of an anthropologist of, of medical education culture. Um, and uh, just cl closing uh, quote and a uh, little advocacy for exploring assumptions. And the next stage is really taking your, your assumptions and then elevating them to principles and moving maybe from more format-driven models of education to principle-driven. Um, and we have about two minutes, if, if there are any. We um, actually have a few more than that, we, because we, we started a little late. OK. And if people need to leave, we certainly under, understand. Um, any reflections, questions, ways you think this could be operationalized at UVA? Yeah, over here. Well, I just had a, a quick question. And again, I'm coming back from the uh, internal medicine residence program. Thanks for all the time and energy you spent with us over the past couple of days. Um, I was wondering what your thoughts on uh, like how much time should uh, the, the timing around formal education. Like right now, we have two 45-minute sessions, or like in, in medical school classes are like from eight to one, and like, and it always seems just like droning on with not much diversity in the in the style of, of uh -huh. the lecture or the style of the of what the teacher is trying to do for the learners. Like, in in terms of time limits, what's the best way to to make sure that you're you're making sure you're covering all the information without just putting it one after the other and making it because now we're having med students when I was in med school, no one went to class. They did it on their own time because the timing of the lectures and having to pay attention for that long wasn't suitable to their learning style. Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, I guess my response is that learning is always happening and teaching is always happening. I say to faculty, every time you walk down the hall, you're teaching, you're modeling something. But it sounds like you're making the um, distinction between sort of f the formal curriculum that might happen in classrooms versus the on sort of on the fly. Learning is that yeah, is that like correct? in in say in morning report, like what what would you say the appropriate duration yeah. of these classes should be? Yeah, you know, I would I would move away from the duration question and think a little bit more about principles of adult learning and and um, whether the methods of education are rooted in how people learn best. And we, we know certain things about adult learners that they learn when something is relevant to them. So to the extent that you can make things connected to a case, an actual patient, uh, and then link the um, information, the content knowledge to that, it's often relevant. Um, giving people the opportunity to actually work with information rather than just, I mean, now in the technological age, a lot of the content, you know, we have something called a flip classroom where you can watch a really excellent lecture in two or three times speed in your pajamas, but then you come in and the important stuff is, is working with that information. So thinking about uh, what helps adults to learn and make it relevant, I think is more important than actually how many minutes the, the session is, because it really should be qu quality time. I know, is that helpful? Um, yep, back up here. Thank you very much. Um, I was wondering, how, how does one help colleagues, uh, help sensitize colleagues to the fact that they may be functioning based on their assumptions when they haven't mm -hmm. had the privilege of sitting here for the last yeah. hour? <laughs> so um, one of the things that we actually do, as because this is like a half day at the Harvard Macy, um, we, we learn some skills with um, something called humble inquiry, which is learning to ask questions. It's actually listen to your colleague and maybe just say, tell me more or tell me about. Um, and the attitude of the questioner ho hopefully could be, uh, should be one of really genuine openness and curiosity to try to get at, um, at the other person's sort of underlying assumption and, and also a willingness to sort of be humble and vulnerable in sharing your own. And so there are, there are ways of, you know, there are pure coaching skills that allow us to do that. But it takes a little, it takes a little time and a safe space to be able to, to explore, because it, it can be touchy, because people can often feel like you're trying to get them to, to get to a right assumption or a different assumption. But I think the first step is really just to be open to the fact that there's a diversity of uh, often assumptions that are driving uh, people. I have a bit of a follow-up to that, and that would be whether creating some team teaching opportunities might be one way in which that kind of engagement can happen as you're working in preparation for, for doing yeah, something absolutely. together in ways that are new to both of you. 
Yeah, and really making explicit that when you're doing team teaching, that part of it is preparing and talking about how if it's a co-facilitating situation and then debriefing afterwards and having those debriefing conversations. And again, with genuine curiosity about what went well, what could have been done differently. Uh, and I think, you know, often we really expand our perspective. Any other? I mean, I, I, I'm going to, um, I'll be here for at least a few more minutes before we have yeah. to move on to the next thing. Uh, so I'm happy to talk with people down here. Well, I'd like to uh, thank Liz for getting us started on our walks. <laughs> um, and, uh, and I would recommend the uh, Alexandra Horowitz book um, to you. You can just sort of read it chapter by chapter as she, t as she takes her, her different walks through a very familiar and suddenly unfamiliar <laughs> Uh, neighborhood. Um, I invite you to join us next week uh, for a program in conjunction with the Virginia Festival of the Book. Uh, we have Martina Scholtens here from um, British Columbia, from Vancouver, uh, talking about her book that came out earlier or last year, Your Heart is the Size of Your Fist, A Doctor Reflects on Ten Years in a Refugee Clinic. So please join us then, and now please join me in thanking Liz Gaufberg. Oh, thank you. This is great. Thank you. Thank you.